A recent report point out that when women participate in economy identically to men, it adds up to $28 trillion or 26% to the annual global GDP in 2025. That means uh, creating more opportunity for girls to go to school and get education and skill and expanding job opportunity for women across the world. Joining us today to discuss women issue and global gender equality is Susan Mackham, USAID Senior Gender Coordinator. Welcome to WeWe, Susan. Thank you. So, um, you know, when we talk about gender equality, a lot of people think that it's all about women. So I want to start with you, uh, uh, to start our conversation today by, you know, discussing with you what gender equality means and um, what we try to achieve with gender equality. Mm. Thank you very much for having me here today. At USAID, we believe in gender equality and women's empowerment across all the work that we do. And as you said, it's not just about women and girls. Gender is about men and boys and women and girls and all the roles that they play in society. So the work we do at USAID is to close the gaps in access to resources. So if the resources are education or land ownership or even citizenship, we wanna make sure that women and girls and men and boys all can do those things and have access to those resources. Um, when it comes to decision-making, we look at men and boys, women and girls and see what control do they have within their own families, societies, and in the country to make sure that all the citizens in a country can have access to decision making. So really it's two sides of the same coin, women and men, uh, boys and girls, we all have to work together. And the goal is that in working towards gender equality and women's empowerment, we can build um, a better society for all the members of society. So with USAID, you know, Gender Equality and Women Empowerment uh, Policy Program, you and your team travel, you know, across the world to work with the government in partnership with USAID to promote gender equality. Uh, have you observed, you know, what it takes for a country to, you know, achieve greater um, gender equality uh, than the other? Mm, yes. And I have to say, although my team at USAID is small, we have gender champions all across the agency working in Washington and in all of our missions around the world who care very much for these issues. And so in countries, we work with governments as well as members of civil society, individuals, political parties, all focused on this goal. Um, we think that we need to work at three different levels. First, we work with individuals to help build their capacity and willingness um, to take roles in society. We work to change institutions. A lot of institutions around the world are um, not built for gender equality. So whether it's a political institution or a banking institution or even the institution of uh, social institutions like marriage and issues of divorce, they're not even though they might seem gender neutral, they treat men and women very differently. And so we look at the institutions. And then at the third level, we have to look at attitudes because around the world, many men and women don't believe that men and women are equal. And so we work to try to change attitudes about equality, about leadership, about gender-based violence, and address these issues. What we found is we need the right combination of um, attitude change, institutional change, and individuals willing to step up to take um, opportunities that are given to them. So in the end, it's about will. Um, if there is a movement both from the top and at the grassroots level, we see movement ha happen quite quickly. So um, as you just mentioned, you know, you work to, you know, uh, uh, make the policy, you know, work uh, at the institution level. And how can you ensure that, um, going back a little bit, you know, we know that when a girl and young women get education and skill, they make a big contribution, not to only to themselves, but the, the country. Mm -hmm. But how can we ensure that the need for education and skill, you know, get prioritized by sustainable development financing, you know, financing from the government and also for the donors. Yes, it's a very complex issue. Uh, first of all, we work a lot to make sure that parents believe that their girls should stay in school. Around the world, we've come to a point where it's almost equal enrollment for boys and girls at the primary level, but when we get to the secondary level, there's a huge drop off in the number of girls who continue to enroll in school. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that parents want to keep their girls in school and they're willing to provide the resources that they need. 
At the same time, we're working with governments around the world to make sure schools are appropriate for girls. So whether it's the school building, the bathroom facilities, the teachers, the materials, even the way um, girls and boys get to school at the secondary level. We're trying to make sure that that is a safe environment and um, that girls have a safe way to get to school for those. So we have that. And then the third, as you mentioned, is we need sustainable support for those school systems. We need to make sure that governments are willing to pay those teachers on a regular basis. We need to make sure that the schools are kept. So that really is the political will of the government to support the programs that we've started. You mentioned about you know safety for mm -hmm. girls you know, going to school. and. Violence against women remains the biggest issue, mm -hmm. and for, for Cambodia, you know, we still see increasing number of women, you know, experience domestic violence. How do you look at this, you know, complex issue, and what do you think, you know, we need to change to stop uh, violence against women? Well, unfortunately, gender-based violence is an issue in every country where we live and work. Here in the U.S., in Cambodia, and every country I've been to, it's different. You know, sometimes it's private, sometimes it's more street harassment or uh, harassment in the workplace, but it exists around the world. So what we try to do is both work to respond when gender-based violence does happen, make sure the services are there, make sure that we can help um, the survivors of it, both with the health system, um, with the legal system, make sure the people that surround them are appropriately responding to it. But then we also look at the drivers. What is causing this violence? And so we look at those issues. Oftentimes we do a lot of attitude change. Um, and also, even though it seems a little bit wonky, this issue of gender. What is a good man? What is a good woman? And if you define a good man as someone who controls his wife or his kids, then it's hard to get around gender-based violence. When we start defining that, the partnership between men and women and how they build that in the family and that being a good partner means supporting your spouse, um, both financially, emotionally, um, with health issues. When we get to those issues, then we get to the crux of how do we uh, prevent um, gender-based violence? How do we solve our conflicts through words and other means rather than hitting or, or other things. Mm -hmm. So coming back to USA uh, ID, gender equality and women empowerment, um, can you explain how big is, is it, uh, you know, the scope of USA ID, gender equality and women empowerment program across the world and how much it is supported by the US Congress and if in the case of budget cut, how you know the country that how this would affect the country that receives support from USAID uh, gender program well, what our goal is, is to not make gender a separate issue on the side. We don't want to say, we're doing energy, we're doing Ebola, we're doing extreme poverty, and then we're doing gender over here. What we are working to do is to make sure that gender issues are taken into account regardless of the work that we're doing. And so that it's just integral to the work. So we don't try to have a separate line item, budget item, for gender. We want to make it part of all those programs and make sure that all of the staff across USAID understand gender issues, can do a gender analysis and build it into the program work that we're doing. Obviously, if any budget cuts happen, that would affect USAID across the board, but we're hoping that with the integration of gender, it wouldn't be a specific hit on these issues, that it would really just be part of the larger programs. Mm -hmm. um, Part of the USAID gender equality and women empowerment is to empower young girls, you know, through technology, innovation, and science. Um, I want you to explain, you know, how a USAID work with other government across, you know, uh, other world to really help women to stay in school and, you know, being uh, the master of technology and innovation in, say, you know, in the next uh, decade or so. Right. Well, young people today are using technology like never before, and you know, in many countries where we work, the whole idea of a desktop computer just doesn't happen. Uh, young kids are going straight to mobile phones and using their mobile phones to access the internet and communicate with such a wide variety of people around the world. And so we are working with governments, but as well as the private sector, uh, groups like Nike and Intel, to find ways that we can reach young people and communicate with them in a way that they're used to being communicated with with their friends. So sometimes we provide information about schooling, um, about the web 
weather, um, whatever interests them, um, sometimes about gender-based violence and how it's not appropriate. So we communicate that way. We also try to train young men and women um, about how to use technology so that they can benefit from it. So we'll do digital, uh, liter we call them digital literacy programs, so that it's not just texting your friends, but how can you, can you access information um, over the phone? In some cases where it's hard to go to school, we're doing more online courses so that people can retain um, their schooling if they're unable to go to a classroom. We're also using it to help with economic growth, giving young people the skills that they have so that they can move into the workforce. Not everyone's going to go to university, and so we give vocational skills, rather that is, sometimes it's automotive uh, mechanic, sometimes it's sewing, but oftentimes more and more it's online and how they can use their online skills to move into the new economy. Mm -hmm. And recently, you know, the U.S. government had created a Let's Go Little uh, initiative, mm -hmm. you know, that to help 60 million girls to go to go to school. And I want to know how much a uh, USAID, you know, involved in that um, a Let's Go Learn initiative. Right. Well, we are very proud of Let Girls Learn, and it really builds on years of work that USAID has been doing for adolescent girls in school. Um, we have a huge um, program on quality basic education, which isn't defined by age. We need to provide that reading and writing skills for students around the world, regardless of their age. But what we've also found with Let Girls Learn, as, as I've said before, even if the school is perfect and the teachers and the classroom and the books are there, so many other things are going on in adolescent girls' life. So we're also looking at the health programs we provide. So is it a nutrition program? Is it a um, sexual and reproductive health program? Uh, something that helps prevent gender-based violence? Also, what are we doing to empower girls? Not just keeping them in school, but can we provide mentoring? Can we provide kind of peer-assisted learning? Can we provide sports programs? All of these things that not only um, add to her empowerment, but they're adding to the way she looks about her life. Because every year we keep a girl in school, as you said before, it not only improves her health and her economic um, earning ability in the future, but what we found is it affects the health of her children and how likely her children are to stay in school. And of course that has a ripple effect across the whole community. So we're really looking at the whole girl, education, health, economic empowerment, and really trying to move girls through adolescence into adulthood. For my last question, um, to what extent do you think uh, USAID Gender Equality and Women Empowerment Program has been successful so far? And moving forward, what are the challenges that USAID and its partner are facing right now? Well, we at USAID have been working on gender issues for a long time. Under this administration, we passed the new gender policy, and that has had a great effect all across the agency. There are more staff than ever that have been trained in gender issues, even if they don't work on it every single day. They understand gender issues. We have more programming that is not just a standalone program for women and girls, but it's actually getting to the crux issue of gender, and it's working with men and boys and women and girls together uh, to empower women and, and be more sustainable over the long run. Um, um, so we've made, it was kind of a nice jump start. Um, the policy has really, really invigorated um, the USAID's attention to gender. So I think uh, with what we've just been finishing up in New York with the UN General Assembly, there was the passage of the Sustainable Development Goals, looking ahead to 2030. These new goals both have a separate um, goal focused on gender equality, but more importantly, gender is across all of the other goals as well. So whether it's regard to healthcare, maternal and child health, whether it's regard, regard to agriculture or violence and conflict, gender is woven throughout it. So we're at a really exciting, important time where not just USAID, but other governments, civil society, individuals around the world are really focused on the importance of gender and more importantly, ready to get working on the issue. Thank you so much, Susan, for joining us today. Thank you.